So I want to thank you all for joining today. We have a couple special speakers. And just so you guys know, we are on a webinar format, so I can't see you. Um, if you do have a question you would like to ask, you are welcome to use the raise hand feature. And you can also use the chat or the Q&A box. I will be monitoring that um, over the course of the, the meeting today. And we will have time after each speaker for just a couple minutes of Q&A. Um, so we might not be able to get to everyone's questions, but we will try to at least get to, to a few of them if time allows. We're also gonna have a break at 10. And I do want to let everyone know if you are submitting a proposal for the IRWM process, um we will be discussing setting up a a location and a and a time on august 23rd to decide when we can go over presentations so with all that being said um our first speaker today is dr fairfax and she is talking to us from cal state channel islands and are you ready to present yes yes okay so she will be well i'll let her talk about what she's going to be presenting you guys have seen the agenda so uh thank you so much for joining us the council we're really um excited to hear you speak awesome well thanks for having me uh i'm gonna be talking today about beavers in california and especially coastal california and how they can sort of be our partners in restoration, but also um, be something we need to think about as we sort of welcome them back into these landscapes. What are the pros, cons, and everything in between of having beavers back? So first off, beavers in California. A lot of people maybe are less familiar with the fact that we have a pretty healthy population of beavers here. Beavers were here for a long time before Europeans were. Um, beavers have been found in the fossil evidence dating back thousands of years throughout California. There is a strong indigenous history of beavers in this state from the North Coast to the South Coast, from the Sierras all the way down into the estuaries. So beavers are definitely something that have been here for a long time and they are still here today. So these little bitty orange dots on these maps, those are verified sightings of beavers throughout the state of California, um, provided by iNaturalist. And you can see there's some pretty big clusters around the Bay Area. There's a little chunk down there between LA and San Diego. They're kind of scattered around throughout the mountains. Um, but zooming in down by us in the Ventura River watershed and Ventura County more broadly, there aren't a ton of beaver sightings recently. Um, there's one or two, um, one of which is mine. <laughs> I have gone to search for them. Um, and they definitely were here. So we had beavers all up in the Sespe until about 2000 that were being regularly seen. Um, and then just in the last couple of decades, there have been very, very few sightings, but they're nearby. There is a thriving population in Santa Barbara County. There's a thriving population in San Luis Obispo County. There's a thriving population up by Bakersfield and beavers follow the water. And these waterways do eventually make their way down to the coast. So it's only a matter of time before beavers sort of reintegrate themselves into this landscape. They were here historically and they will certainly come back. Which is good, I think, in a lot of ways because we are increasingly looking at them as a way to mitigate wildfire damage, drought, climate change more broadly. This is being talked about more and more and more. And if we want to have beavers uh, providing these ecosystem services for us, we do have to have beavers in the first place. So if you're thinking, hmm, hold on now, beavers and wildfire, that's not uh, something I think about or have heard about a lot. What does a giant uh, semi-aquatic rodent have to do with wildfire, which is a um, landscape scale disturbance that affects all of us every single year? Well, a lot of us have heard about beavers as nature's engineers. And hopefully in the next couple of minutes, I'll also have you convinced that they can be our firefighters too. When beavers move into a landscape, especially in California, a lot of the times the streams they're moving into look something like this little illustration I just popped up. They're very degraded, they're single thread, they're not complex from a water standpoint, from a shape standpoint, from an ecosystem standpoint, 
Um, they're simplified and they are largely unable to support the ecosystem around them. They've cut down so far into their own riverbed that they no longer connect to their floodplains. But that doesn't stop beavers from moving in. Beavers are outstanding ecosystem engineers and they can really uh, drastically modify the ecosystem and the physical shape of the land if they choose to do so. So when they move into a system like this, they build a dam and that dam starts to slow down the water. And it's really important that these dams do not stop the water because that's not how the beavers construct them. They aren't using concrete like people do when we build our dams. Um, these are leaky permeable structures made of sticks and stones and a little bit of mud. And the water just starts to pool up behind it a little bit. And it continues to trickle downstream, although maybe a little bit slower. And a consequence of that slowing the water down is it gives it time to seep out into the soil. And that dam being a physical barrier in the stream bed itself pushes the water back up so that it reconnects to the floodplain. And that starts to let that riparian or that creekside or riverside ecosystem really start to expand and reestablish itself. And busy as a beaver is a phrase for a real reason, not just because of their, um, you know, it, it sounds cool, it's a good alliteration, that it, it's actually their behavior. So once they build a dam like this, they don't stop, they continue to build. They'll make that dam longer, they'll make it taller, they'll make it stronger. They wanna have a larger pond. And in doing so, they're slowing down that water even more, and they're developing an even larger riparian ecosystem that starts to transform into riparian wetlands, which are really important and a critical landscape type of which we've lost over 90% in the last 200 years. Now, these big ponds, the whole reason the beavers want to have a big pond like this is because they are vulnerable on the land. So a beaver, if you have not seen one in person, is a semi-aquatic rodent. It weighs anywhere from 40 to 100 pounds. So these are big creatures. They have a huge paddle tail on the back, um, webbed back feet, little uh, grabby hands with fingers, and they are like quite spherical. So this is a fatty round mammal. When they're walking around on the land, it's more of a waddle than a walk. Um, very, very vulnerable to predators of which we actually do have here. So mountain lions, bears, um, in other parts of the country, wolves are predators of beavers. And if the beaver's on the land, it's easy pickings. But as soon as beavers get into the water, they're almost invincible against their predators. They are outstanding swimmers. They can hold their breath for 15 minutes and they can swim faster than pretty much every predator we have. So beavers are building this pond and doing all of this engineering because they wanna feel safe and they wanna have a home that's not vulnerable to predation. And part of that means they also need to be able to go outside of their pond into the landscape, into the floodplain more broadly to gather food and to gather building material without being in danger. And to accomplish that, they will also dig canals out from their home ponds into the floodplain and into the river corridor. And these act like little irrigation canals throughout the landscape. And so they continue to route the water further and further away, um, let it seep into the floodplain. And the result of this is that you get a highly complex river form and a really complex ecological system that is being supported by pretty consistent water sources. So the beavers are slowing down so much water during this wet period of the year that they are just pumping it out into the floodplain where these plants can access it, even if they're pretty far away from the river channel itself. And if you were to visit a beaver pond in the field, you might see something that looks like this. You've got the dam on the left, a bunch of beavers. The artist did a great job. The ones in the background on land are pretty round and awkward. The ones in the water look like otters. They're very sleek and agile. And you've got their lodge, which is a separate structure they actually live in. And looking at this, like, yes, you can see that the beavers have created the significant change in the landscape, but how that sort of scale of change would compete with something like wildfires, which is a huge, huge process, is not immediately clear unless you start to zoom out and you think about beaver landscape engineering, not at the scale of I'm in the field, I'm right next to a beaver pond, but you think about it from the fact that beavers aren't building just one dam. They're not building just one canal. They're truly modifying the entire landscape. They're making fundamental changes to how the water moves through watersheds. And as a result, they can create this just absolutely enormous amount of hydrologic complexity. If you already know how to find beaver dams and satellite images, then you know what you're looking at on the left. And if you don't, that's okay, because I'm gonna highlight some key features for you. This whole landscape is being maintained by about one family of beavers. That's mom and dad beaver and anywhere from one to four juvenile beavers at home. And they have built a ton of dams. They have dug many canals. They have just one lodge, so just one house, just one family of beavers supports 
all of this complexity in the landscape. And that enormous amount of complexity and change from just being a single thread river channel into being this whole riparian wetland is what makes them these really drought and fire resistant ecosystems. When we don't have beavers, the plants are very dependent on infiltrating precipitation. So we need rain, we need snow, which we don't get here, um, to get into the soil and to sort of percolate through. It's like watering your plants from above. Our streams are very small and incised and degraded and they don't have a ton of water in them anymore for the most part. And so the area that they can influence is not particularly large. But it doesn't really matter as long as we have rain because the rain keeps the plants green and it keeps it so that they're less flammable. Um, I don't think I have to harp on the point with this group. We don't have a lot of rain. Um, we are having less and less rain every year. And as soon as we enter that kind of a drought state, that's when the ecosystem engineering of beavers really starts to shine. In drought conditions, all of the plants that can't access water in the soil are now going to start to wilt and wither and turn that kind of classic golden brown color, which is fine on the hill slopes where that's what they're supposed to do year to year. But down in the river corridor and down in the floodplains, they shouldn't be going dry. They shouldn't be turning crispy, crunchy yellow and gold. Floodplain plants should be wet and green pretty much year round. And that's what the beavers do is they build this pond. They store so much more water in the soil during the wet periods that even when we have a drought and we cut off all of that rain, there's plenty of water to go around and keep this ecosystem green. And that's extremely important when we have a fire, because as soon as there's an ignition in the landscape, fire takes the path of least resistance. It burns whatever's easiest to burn, and that's the dry material. And we've seen it here. Fire has burned through the river bottoms because they are so dry, and they shouldn't be that way. <clears throat> river networks are supposed to be like natural speed bumps for fire because they're supposed to be wet, broad corridors that are relatively unflammable. But what we see in these degraded systems is that they burn quite easily. What we see in these beaver dam systems is that they don't. They're very wet. In fact, they are too wet to burn. And this isn't just something that we've seen in air quotes in a conceptual model. We've also seen this in the field. These photos are from my colleague, Dr. Joe Wheaton at Utah State University. And this is within the Sharps fire up in Idaho. There was big fire, it came through this landscape where we weren't having any beavers, it burned right through the river bottom, completely obliterated that riparian ecosystem. Um, very little life was left intact in this area, except where we had beavers, where there were a lot of beavers in this fire scar. The fire came down the hill slopes just the same, but once it got to the beaver dammed area, it couldn't burn it. It was too wet to burn. And so it just stalled until the wind could blow it over and then go up the other hill slope. And so yes, in this case, it's not this miraculous fire stopping. It didn't contain the fire, but there's this huge patch of ecosystem, of riparian wetland ecosystem that didn't burn, that's still intact, that has the potential to be a refuge for animals and plants and potentially people during wildfire. We need patches that don't burn. We need patches that slow the fire down. And so when I saw this, and when I think about this in my own research, I'm thinking, okay, well, without beavers, we're seeing pretty much total ecosystem destruction. And we're seeing really intense fires. I mean, those little white patches in the image on the left, that's ash piles where there used to be willows. So this is not um, like a light, good fire kind of burn. There is good fire and we do need that too, but this is not bad. Um, this is bad, intense burning. But when there's beavers, you can see it's the dams, it's the canals that are reflecting that sunlight back up at the drone that create this sort of strip of fire resistant ecosystem. So I wanted to see, does this actually happen everywhere or is it just something that happens if you're really lucky? And to do that, I looked at five fires across um, five states and all of these fires at the time I thought were very large fires. I don't think that anymore. Um, and there's a lot of beavers within these fire perimeters. And looking through all of these, what I did essentially was I looked at every creek within these fire perimeters, figured out where the beavers were, figured out where the beavers were not, and then compared how green were they before and after the fire. Did the beaver dammed areas actually stay green or not? They're staying green, they're not burning. Um, if they're not staying green, they are burning. And what I ultimately found was that they were staying very green. Um, this picture that I'm showing you is from the Manter fire, which burned in uh, Sequoia National Forest in 2000. And it's a great example. On the right fork is a creek that didn't have any beavers and it burned straight to the bottom. Um, no vegetation left at all, no water left at all. But on the left is a beaver dammed section of a river. And you can see on that beaver dam, 
it has created this sort of patch of green around it. The fire definitely tried to get in. You can see it pushing into the fire or pushing into that riparian vegetation, but ultimately not being able to burn all the way through it because it was too wet to burn. And the numbers that came out of my study looking at these five different fires was that I found that the beaver dammed areas were three times more protected from wildfire than areas that didn't have beavers. And when you think about how many more beavers we used to have in California and the American West and this continent as a whole, that was a huge difference. Like there were anywhere from 100 to 400 million beavers out there doing this kind of engineering, creating these fireproof patches. Today, we have maybe 10 to 30 million, like 10% of the historic population. And when we lost all those beavers, we didn't just lose the animal, we lost to this kind of ecosystem engineering and these benefits as well. And I did mention that I don't think that these are big fires anymore. So we are now in the age of megafires, which is a more uh, intense type of wildfire. Megafires are defined as a fire with a burn area larger than 100,000 acres. And being a megafire itself, being large, isn't necessarily bad. There is a lot of good fire and you can have really big good fires. Um, but a lot of megafires get to be the size they are because they're exhibiting really extreme, not great behaviors. So they make their own weather systems, things like pyrocumulus and pyrocumulonimbus clouds, which are fire breathing dragons and ash spewing clouds that will make secondary fires around your primary fire and they merge together to make a bigger fire and it just keeps going. So they accelerate themselves and they ramp themselves up. And this results in these really explosive spread rates um, and these huge swaths of moderate and severe burning. And that's a problem. And when I'm thinking about my research that I've done on beavers and wildfires, I did wonder, okay, well, beavers helped out in this kind of smaller fires, but what about these mega fires? Because that's what we're seeing. Like up in Northern California right now in the McKinney fire, that one went from like no thousand acres to 30,000 acres essentially overnight. And that was too fast and that's extreme. It's not at the stage of mega fire yet by size definition, but it is making its own weather. And that's not sort of the way the fires should be in this state. So I'm wondering, can beavers still help if that's our fire future? Or is this sort of a ship has already sailed situation? Well, I actually looked at three fires in the Rocky Mountains to answer that question because they had three mega fires in 2020. And unlike California, the Rocky Mountains does not have a strong history of big fires. And so these fires were able to kind of just burn at will. They were not running into other fire scars as often and they weren't being influenced by the fire history as much. So looking in these three mega fires, I then wanted to just see, okay, can beavers still create these fireproof patches even if fires are more extreme? And to answer that question, I looked at DNBR, which is a measure of burn severity. If you're a really big nerd and you like satellite data, this slide is for you. If it, that's not what you wanna hear, just look at the sentence at the bottom. Um, DNBR is a satellite derived measure of how burnt the landscape is and it exploits the difference in how light reflects off of healthy vegetation versus burned areas. And you can do a bunch of math with that data to figure out that a higher DMBR means that you have an area that is more burnt. So I use this measure to look at these mega fires to figure out exactly how much more burnt are areas without beavers compared to areas with beavers. We can see that they stay green with our eyes. So in this picture, this is before the fire, we've got some beaver ponds along this uh, creek. If you can't see them yourself right now, it's probably easier to see them once we see what it looks like after it burned. Um, they're the only thing left in the landscape that's green. And this is from these fires in the Rocky Mountains. And it's great that we can see this, but what DMBR lets us do is actually put a number to it and quantify it. And I really wanna have a number so I can say exactly how much less burnt are these beaver dammed areas. What I ultimately saw in my data was that they were way less burnt. So I looked at places that were not rivers. This is like the hill slopes, meadows, fields, things that are not within the river network. I looked at the river network in places that did not have beavers. And then I looked at these beaver dammed areas. And what I found overall was that there was a really significant difference, both in the sense that it's large in scale and that it is statistically significant in how these areas burnt. In the non-river areas, 60% of the land was burnt at either high or moderate severity. And that's where you can start to see some pretty significant ecosystem uh, destruction. Anything that's in that low and unburned category, that's considered good fire usually and can be considered fire refugia. So it's a place where the burning is not so extreme that it'll harm ecosystems, people, houses, that kinds of things. So in the non-river areas, the majority of the landscape is burning in a somewhat destructive way. 
when we're in the river network, but not where we have fevers, it's not much better. It's about 50-50, which is better than 60-40, but not, not enough that it makes me feel good. Um, rivers shouldn't be burning at high severity 30% of the time. That's way too much. Um, but in the beaver dammed area, it's a completely different picture. Only 11% of the beaver dammed areas burned at moderate or high severity, while almost 90% were at low or completely unburned. Over half were completely unburned, like the fire could not even touch it. Um, and then about a third, it got that low burn intensity. That's where you have like a little bitty fire that snakes along the ground, doesn't burn your trees, doesn't destroy the ecosystem, ultimately does good for the landscape. So this is huge. Beavers are still able to create these sort of strips of low flammability landscape, even in the face of megafires. And to me, that's really significant because we build fire breaks that look similar to this. Like we go out and we clear vegetation. We try to make the landscape less flammable by putting fire retardant or mulch or water on it. So we're going out there building these same things that beavers are naturally creating just by living in our watersheds. And I want to emphasize that this kind of thing that we're seeing uh, increasingly often is not an anomaly. It's not like I've cherry picked to find the two examples where beavers can do this. This was observed back in 2000 when I was a child. Um, before I, like anybody was really thinking about this, the helicopter survey from the Burned Area Emergency Response Team, they saw this and they were like, that's fascinating. It didn't burn by the beaver dams. And they took this photo way before anyone was really studying this. We've seen this happen up in Canada in absolutely huge fires, 1.5 million acres. And I'm like, good, <laughs> you know, California still has room to grow and it looks like this can continue to be helpful. Um, we've seen this in Idaho very, very clearly that the beaver dammed areas are resisting burning even during otherwise largely destructive fires. I've seen it in Colorado uh, on the ground in the Rocky Mountains where they have compounding uh, other issues like beetle kill making their forests even more flammable. And I just saw this again in Oregon this past year in the bootleg fire which was a kind of a cool case study because this is a largely flat landscape. And so there's not even topography that's protecting the watershed here. It was just the beavers that kept the fire out of that floodplain. And putting all this together, I think that we should really start to think about beavers more as part of a climate action plan. They're not the only thing. There's so much work to do on climate change. Beavers can't fix it all, but they can definitely help our riverscapes and fixing our riverscapes has sort of compounding benefits for us. And me and one of my colleagues from NOAA wrote a paper about this together where we go through every single aspect of beaver ecosystem engineering and tie it back to things that we're facing as challenges under a changing climate and how beavers can help with that from carbon to water temperature to water quality to water quantity, um, droughts, fires, floods. We go through it and uh, sort of describe what beavers do and what they can't do in a large amount of detail. So if you wanna read all of the details of that, this paper is open access. Um, you can find it online or you can email me and I can send you a PDF. And I'd be happy to answer your questions because there's usually quite a few um, about beavers, especially in our own watersheds. If you have a question, you can either raise your hand or it might be easier if you um, put it in the chat. I do see some people with some questions already. So um, Tom, I'm asking you to unmute. Yeah, hi. And I, I can't find my uh, my uh, video. Uh, okay. Anyway, um, so uh, you know, there's been a lot of discussion in the Ventura River watershed around the the notion of beavers. Do you see any animal welfare concerns considering how our climate has shifted? That's a great question. Um, so I think that in the Ventura River watershed, there are a few places that beavers would probably have a good chance of success today, but there's a lot more places where they need a little bit of a helping hand before we put them in place or try to welcome them back into place. Um, we do have a lot of predators here and you don't wanna just drop off a beaver to be a mountain lion snack, that's not ethical. Um, to fix sort of that situation, what we can do is what's called low-tech process-based restoration. So we go in, we add wood to the rivers, we build things like beaver dam analogs, which are fake beaver dams. Um, we try to kickstart a bunch of that restoration already so that if and when beavers move back into this watershed, they are not moving into like basically a death trap. Beavers are very industrious and they will live in non-ideal habitats. There's a thriving population in downtown San Jose, which is also not um, ideal beaver habitat, 
Uh, there's a bunch of them out in the Mojave Desert that have made use of groundwater springs. There are beavers above the tree line in the Rocky Mountains where they have to go down slope to harvest any wood, but that's just better habitat than what's around them. So they can make it work. There's tons of them on the Santa Inez River. They used to be all over the Sespe River. Um, there's places in our watershed that work today, but I do think that we definitely need to do some more work before we're ready to go all in on beavers here. And so that predation pressure is your assessment of why they petered out from the last reintroduction because they they were here and they were reintroduced and then they were now gone again. I think it was a big part of it. They, um, I mean, there's predation pressure. We had the uh, Sespe flood in the 1960s and that was huge. Uh, and that was like a thousand year flood and it blasted through a lot of beaver habitat. And I've gone up and looked at flood deposits from that along the Sespe River corridor. And there's beaver chewed sticks in the flood deposits from that flood. So I know that flood destroyed a lot of beaver habitat. And that's kind of where we had concentrated um, beaver populations. And so if you take out 80% of the population in this huge flood, it makes it hard for the rest of the population to continue to thrive. And then things like predation become a bigger problem because the beavers are hoofing it overland um, and in smaller waterways to look for new habitat because their old one was just sort of super scoured by the flood. Um, I don't think it's just climate that pushed them out of here. There's beavers down between LA and San Diego that are thriving. Like I said, there's lots of beavers in Santa Barbara County that are thriving and San Luis Obispo County that are thriving. And they've also experienced significant climate change and land use change, but the beavers have made it work there. One last question on that, if I might. Um, in Slow County, they're below Nascimento Dam. And in, uh, if they're on the San Inez, they're below Kachuma. So they have sort of these reliable water sources. You don't see drought and heat stress as being an issue? They're not just below those dams. They're also above those dams um, in both of those situations. I don't see, I mean, I've done a study on beavers and droughts in northern Nevada and on undammed rivers that were ephemeral and went dry four months of the year. Um, beavers moved in as soon as low-tech process-based restoration was started and within the span of about five years built over 150 dams. And in the construction of those dams, they raise groundwater, they recharge aquifers, and they increase the duration of flow every year. And so they can create their own sort of stable water system as long as they have a couple of years to get established. So yes, it sucks that it's dry here, um, but that's never stopped beavers before. They live in the Great Basin. They live in places that are much drier, have much less reliable water. Um, the beavers that we have right now living on these big rivers that are connected to dams, like, yeah, that's the easiest place you'd live. Why would you choose to go challenge yourself when there's like a wonderful home to get started in? But as their population grows, we are seeing them go into tributaries. We're seeing them move up into headwaters. We're seeing them move. Um, they're up past Kachuma Dam and they're also, um, they're pretty much at Gibraltar Dam right now on the Santa Inez. So, you know, they're not going to stay just confined to those places where we have uh, affected the flow. They take advantage of it because it's nice for them, but they live on undammed and pretty flashy and ephemeral streams elsewhere. Thanks. Thank you. Um, we got a couple questions in the chat. Um, I think you might have answered some of them. One question is, if unable to successfully relocate, talking about these beavers, would these beaver dam analogs be just as effective if properly maintained or partially effective? They're not, they don't accomplish everything beavers do. So beavers, they build dams and then we can build the beaver dam analogs and that can be really comparable in the effects of those structures. But beavers also dig canals. Beavers also go out and chew vegetation to help um, sort of add the surface roughness and they pull that wood back into the water. So we'd have to do more than just build the BDAs to fully mimic what beavers do. But beaver dam analogs are really effective, especially at kickstarting the restoration process. And ultimately the goal is to get the river, like the physical river system to be able to take care of itself. And most of our rivers have been pushed out of that state. They can't do that anymore. But if we push them back so that they can use their own natural rivering processes and all that energy that the water carries with it to maintain this resilient structure, then um, you know we don't have to worry quite so much about doing the maintenance ourselves. So yes, BDAs can be super helpful, especially if you build a lot of them. Like 10 years ago, people would just build one or two BDAs and say, all right, we restored the river, um, but that doesn't quite work. We wanna do it more like actual beavers do, which is build lots of them. 
And doing that is just like this continuous speed bump one after another after another for the water that lets it reconnect to the floodplain, grade some sediment so that it's not so incised and start to reestablish that healthy riparian ecosystem. So I'm gonna do one last question and it might be a <laughs> compounding question. Um, Someone's asking, are there downsides of introducing beavers that would have to be managed and planned for? And along with that, I just want to add, like, I've heard that um, like CDFW does have, I don't know what their official size is, but does have concerns of how this would impact like recovering steelhead populations. And um, I guess what are the what are the prohibitive things in um, moving beavers in California? Um, there a lot at you, but <laughs> thank you. It's all good. Um, I mean, well, you can't just move them in California right now. The state just passed a new budget uh, item that's going to establish a state-sponsored beaver restoration program that passed this summer, um, and that has also opened the door for relocation again. We haven't relocated beavers in this state since, I believe, the 1940s, so um, you can't move them for starters, so don't worry about what's going to happen when you do, um, but as we start to relocate again, some of the things to be aware of is that if you move beavers next to human infrastructure like roads or private property, um, beavers are going to do what we want them to do, which is flood and build complexity and put water everywhere. And if you don't want that water on your road or in your basement uh, or in your house, you need to be ready to mitigate that effect of the beavers. And so you can put in pond levelers, which are basically pipes through the dam where you set the max height of the pond, not the beaver, and they can build their dam taller and taller all they want, but they'll never exceed sort of what you decide by putting that pipe in place. You can wrap trees. Um, some people don't want their favorite trees to get chewed on and that's fine. Wrap them in chicken wire, paint them with sand paint. There's lots of ways to deter beavers, put up a fence. I mean, we are also engineers, not just the beavers. We can figure out ways to handle them. Um, the concern with steelhead is a myth. Um, there's been a huge amount of research specifically on beavers and steelhead, and it is overwhelmingly found that beavers benefit steelhead, and especially in dry environments. There's papers in um, nature scientific reports that showed larger steelhead, more steelhead, better steelhead outcomes. They don't have problems getting past beaver dams. Um, they, they, most fish can actually go through beaver dams. There's a lot of permeability in these structures. It's like swimming through just a little log pile. Um, so overwhelmingly, beavers are good for samonids. They provide deep pools. They provide a lot of in-stream structures that these fish need for protection. There's an enormous amount of food that accumulates in these beaver ponds that lets those fish sort of get bulky and big while they don't waste all of their energy swimming against a current because it's relatively slow water. They're not stagnant, and that's where people really start to have fish issues because stagnant water heats up and it'll cook the fish and it'll end their lives. But beaver ponds, the water is always flowing and there's usually a stronger connection to cold groundwater. So you can have this really heterogeneous uh, thermal profile of the ponds and of the streams. Um, there, uh, the biggest issue I've seen uh, ecologically with having beavers is that bullfrogs also like their ponds, um, but it's kind of a hard environmental ethics question. Like if we have sensitive species that need riparian wetlands and they will die without riparian wetlands, which we do. Samonids need it, a lot of our amphibians need it, a lot of our birds need it. Um, do we not create wetlands because a bullfrog could move in and those are invasive, but then also not create habitat for all those threatened and endangered species? Or do we create the habitat and accept that we need to manage the bullfrogs because we, the people, brought the bullfrogs into this system? So that's a management thing that does need to be considered. There's beaver ponds I've visited in California that have bullfrogs, but they also have threatened and endangered species that are doing quite well um, because those species need this kind of habitat too. We can't just not make it because of the risk of an invasive species moving in as well. We, we've lost 90% of our wetlands. We can't keep losing it. Okay, thank you so much. So um, I do wanna get to our next speaker, but... Um... Dr. Fairfax, I just want to thank you so much. Um, and yeah, I, I do have her email. She did share it on the screen. So if any of you guys have any additional questions for her, um, you'll be able to ask her. So thank you so much. Thanks. Okay, Chris, are you ready to go? <clears throat> I, let me uh, share my screen here. This is always a, <clears throat> a moment of... Uh, how does that look? That looks good to me. Okay. 
So um, before I get started, I do want to say to um, about the beavers is that as a young man, uh, I remember beavers in the Sespe, uh, and there was one particularly rich stretch between what is was called Beaver Camp, now closed, down to Lyons, uh, so-called Middle Sespe area. Uh, and I remember that that was a very lush riparian zone. And my memory, I may be wrong, but I believe that area survived the scouting of the 69 flood because I remember being there later than that, it was still there. But my impression uh, from that is that the beavers that remained uh, fell to human uh, predation because uh, we're ending that era of what we still have today of people going out and shooting everything up uh, and uh, taking things down, which is really sad. But that's just my recollection. I don't think sure or not, but the, the idea of the, them coming back to the Sespe has always been a dream of mine. Uh, so it's really to see them. Okay, with that, um, I'm gonna talk about uh, our community supported grazing program here at the Ohio Valley Fire Safe Council. Obviously, I'm the executive director. Uh, for many people in the audience, probably not going to hear anything new, so I apologize for that. Um, I'm also suffering from COVID, so I'm going to play that card if I come across as uh, less than uh, uh, inspiring than I than I feel. Okay, so with that, um, just a short background on where the Ohio Valley Fire Safe Council was is that we um, for it's been around over 20 years. And for most of its time, uh, it proceeded on a grant by project basis. One grant, one project, and that's what is done. Thomas Fire obviously woke us up uh, and we've been after a much more comprehensive risk mitigation strategy. We're currently managing over the next few, next two years, almost 2 million in projects, not including the grazing program. So we certainly have our hands full. We're also part of, uh, in the growing, uh, trend of increased collaboration and coordination across counties and other and regions. Uh, we are one of the founding members of the Ventura County Wildfire Collaborative. Heidi knows this very well uh, as the RCD is the uh, lead agency on the Wildfire Collaborative. We just had a very successful meeting with uh, cities in the county to launch a town hall series. Uh, so um, proud of the fact that we're leaders in, um, in having this kind of uh, careful collaboration and coordination. Like I said, we had this new initiative in 2019 uh, that said we need to take a much deeper dive on how we're going to look at this. Uh, and so we start through an extensive planning process. We ended up with a roadmap telling us where we're going to go. And we started from the proposition is that we, is that we have these 98% of the fires are controlled. And so our well-trained, well-funded, uh, well-equipped fire department can go in there and take care of that. But across the, across the, the country, there's that 2% or so of the fires that are deemed uncontrolled. And so those do 98% of the damage or thereabout. So in order, and that's where communities are truly on their own because by the very nature of a catastrophic fire, that uh, the public agencies are overwhelmed almost instantly. And in any uncontrolled fast moving fire, people are on their own for at least six hours. And like the Thomas fire was much longer than that. So we sought to build, start to build a kind of resilient community that can better prepare for, respond to and recover from a catastrophic fire. And I wanna emphasize about catastrophic, that's from our point of view. It's not necessarily one from an ecosystem point of view. So I don't want to, either there is a lot of demonization of fire going on, uh, but it's, it's an important part of our landscape. And then looking at becoming what, what was called a fire adapted community. I'm going through this quickly because we want to get to the program. And then our goals are risk mitigation. Some of the ones I want to look at is becoming a truly fire adapted community in a fire dependent ecosystem uh, and to build this culture of resiliency because a lot of things that make us more resilient to a catastrophic fire or any natural disaster make us overall a more resilient uh, uh, community, uh, which you know is a benefit in so many areas. So during this planning process, we identified a number of priority projects, many of them so-called foundational projects, building up the data necessary to take the next step. Uh, the ones that are in our yellow are ones that are currently funded and underway. Um, 
and uh, the, the Hawaii Valley Community Wildfire Protection Plan, the fine scale risk mapping, the wildfire vulnerability and evacuation. Uh, those are the ones that are taking our, that the, all the, the almost 2 million in projects that I mentioned early on. And then we're still working on all these other ones uh, as we try to seek funding for them. That gets us to our community supported prescribed grazing program. We launched this program in April of 21. Uh, it was gonna be launched in April of 20, but uh, we all know that things kind of shut down for a while so that we have that lost time. Um, the main, the pro program team from the Fire Safe Council side is myself, uh, Brittany Cole Bush or Cole, uh, and Michael Light from Ventura Brush Goats. And uh, they obviously are our main grazing operators, prescribed grazing operators in our area. And so it takes us to what is prescribed grazing. Uh, and this could consume an entire presentation just talking about this. But principally what it means is that it's the use of herbivores to, as a tool to achieve specific uh, land management objectives, which is different than having animals on the land for livestock production. And in the past, animals being put out on the landscape resulted in overgrazing, which obviously has given rise to a lot of the problems that we have today with an abundance of flashy fuels uh, of non-native grasses, ones that ignite easily and carry the fire to the chaparral. Uh, so it's very different from that. Uh, you can get obviously production out of uh, prescribed grazing, but it's not its primary purpose. And you want to be able to accomplish measurable environmental and ecological goals uh, because uh, prescribed grazing uh, is, seeks to in, in actually improve ecosystem health. And what it, what it means is it's literally a, a prescription is given for any piece of land. And that prescription contains uh, the species and subspecies of animals. We use goats, sheep, and cattle. Uh, and the uh, number of animals, the stocking rate, the duration, the timing of it, and seasonality, uh, the movement of animals across the land, um, all these different factors that uh, achieve the goals, such as fuel reduction, uh, but also achieve the goals of improving the ecosystem health. And that comes from improved soil or organic carbon, which improves hydrology and carbon sequestration, allows for more wet vegetation, and um, is a form of regenerative agriculture. Sometimes people use the term targeted. Uh, depending on what you're doing, it can be synonymous, but generally targeted is in the context of fuel reduction. So you're going after a particular uh, fuel load that you want to reduce. And then there's the community supported grazing program uh, that we call ours a community supported prescribed grazing program because we want to be able to use prescribed grazing. Other community supported programs do not have that. Uh, and often a good example would be up, up north with uh, Sarah Kaiser and that is that uh, like a neighborhood will buy uh, goats together and use them to do field reduction and move them from uh, from lot to lot. And so there's a wide range of scale out there. There's a lot longer, a wide range of, of application of animals on the landscape, but we're looking toward the highest application of, of a prescription for, uh, for grazing. So what we hope to get out of our community supported prescribed grazing program is an overall increased wildfire resiliency for the Ojai Valley and the Venture River watershed, um, looking at taking this to scale, so reduced fuel loads over a very large area. Uh, one of those things we'll talk about in a second is our large scale wildfire intensity reduction zone um, and uh, the, the benefits from that. And we're also looking, so other people are working on this too, so we're all working on what we call a transferable framework that where we can take our lessons learned and, all, and what we build here and share it with others and vice versa. Obviously, we we'll want to bring this up to a greater scale than it is today. Um, and part of the sustaining of this is to build, uh, have economic development and workforce development such that we can have local and regional, regional food and fiber sheds out of the, uh, the scaled up grazing. And all this boils down to the fact that a is that a healthy ecosystem, a healthy watershed is, is more wildfire resilience. They, the two are completely interdependent on one another. 
We are, what makes us a little different from a lot of the uh, uh, grazing programs out there is our multi-stakeholder approach, hence the community support it. And that's looking at involving much more uh, diverse uh, stakeholders uh, in helping to fund the program and benefit from the program. Uh, we think that has many benefits in the long run. Of course, it makes it much more complex in the short term to do it. But we just uh, we have many, many partners, uh, some on, on this, this program today, including the Ohio Valley Land Conservancy uh, and uh, the uh, <clears throat> also the Community Environmental Council has been teamed with, with us lately to expand it to more of a regional approach. The barriers that we face uh, in this are numerous. Um, we have the cost of grazing itself uh, and steps are being taken to reduce that cost both to the landowner and to the operator. We have a land access issues, so we have enough land to maintain the program. We have a lack of off-season um, pasture and off-season revenue to sustain our grazers. We need more grazers. For example, we ought to reach our goals and Santa Barbara were to reach their goals. Uh, we don't have enough qualified grazers to do this. Uh, and then we do suffer from a lack of coordination. We're working on that. Um, we believe most of what we're doing is going to fall within the uh, Cal VTP uh, programmatic EIR or CEQA, but that may change depending on where we are. And then getting people to the public to pay for work on private land is an issue. We also have some regulatory issues, which uh, include the H2HA problem uh, with uh, work visas. Uh, because many of the people that have the skills have to come from other places. And then we also have the ag overtime, which was there to benefit ag workers, but in the context of grazing can, is being uh, very harmful to gra grazing operations. Our funding, we want to look at looking from diverse sources. We've done that so far, uh, and that's just a matter of, of growing. Uh, an example will be that working with the Ventura uh, Ventura County Water uh, Resource Conservation District. We actually did a post uh, Thomas uh, burn scar restoration using that uh, with funding from the State Water Resources Control Board. So we can see that funding for such a program that has multiple objectives and benef benefits gives rise to a diverse uh, um, thing of, of funding. And also we are uh, just beginning to look at uh, actual private investment, uh, principally toward infrastructure and principally toward processing can, can help sustain these regional food and fiber sheds. <clears throat> we launched the program last year, a lot many people on here have attended this event. Uh, we had a stakeholder convening back in June of last year. It was very successful uh, to tell people about it. Uh, and the program's been rolling along steadily ever since. The thing, uh, one of the, one of our goals is to do what we're calling the wildfire intensity reduction zone uh, or the corridor or the super goat highway, if you like that. Um, and that extends roughly from Upper Ojai down both sides of the Ojai Valley and down the Ventura River watershed uh, down to a roughly Casita Springs and Foster Park, uh, the Steelhead Preserve, for example, the Hawaii Land Conservancy, uh, and encompasses uh, primarily private land, but also uh, other lands as well. And what is a wildfire intensity reduction zone? What makes that important is that this is not a fuel break. What this means is that if we can reduce these flashy non-native fuels in this corridor, then it makes them less ignitable, it makes, and, and hopefully with improved soil conditions, uh, the, the plants maintain moisture content longer. It also reduces, and if they're not, if they're reduced, then it reduces the spread of that and gives first responders time to get in there. And the very act of being in there is probably gonna improve firefighter access to begin with. And it also controls flame height, which is very important because flames past a certain height uh, will not allow firefighters to enter the area. So we're looking at giving our first responders time and reducing the ignition potential of, of the landscape by doing this. You will also look to the, uh, to the left and you'll see the Lake Acetas and the Teague watershed around that. We're also targeting that uh, as trying to get, reintroduce uh, grazing into that area. It's also known as the, uh, I think the Casitas open space lands. Um, and we'll talk about that just a second here. What we, we just, on the first round, we unsuccessfully sought funding for what we're calling the white paper, uh, which is um, a research paper on the watershed 
the Teague Watershed to support uh, going to the Bureau of Reclamation and asking if we can introduce prescribed herbivory into the watershed on an experimental basis. Uh, in our discussions with the Casitas Municipal Water District, uh, basically I believe they're in favor of that if the Bureau gives the green light. Uh, so we do have political support to do this, but we're going to have to take another round at looking at the funding for the white paper. It is actually just a first phase paper uh, because we would expect to do monitoring and uh, everything after the fact, once we get in there. But it is an important thing because it does give us uh, additional land, which helps meet our goals, which uh, are our long-term development goals. So there's many reasons to graze the Teague watershed. Uh, I do believe that, uh, not the least of which is my own feeling is based upon having grown up out there. Uh, my in when I, you know, when it was still before the dam was even built, just to, to give a touch of how old I am, um, it is. Um, I believe that the watershed is degraded, and I, I don't know if that's going to come out in empirical research, but I do know that it was heavily uh, agricultural production out there when I was a kid. Uh, there were farms and ranches. Much of what you see from Highway 150 past the entrance and past Santa Ana Creek was irrigated pasture land. And if you go out in there and trespass, you'll still see these massive pipes and remnants of the large retention ponds. And I remember farmers and ranchers just just putting sandbags in the Santa Ana Creek and pumping it out with an industrial six to, to run their fields. So, and then that was all abandoned about 50 years ago. Uh, and I think what we've learned in that 50 years is that land that's been degraded through heavy industrial uh, agricultural use does not improve with an abandonment strategy that we have to put animals back on the landscape to restore it, that's what we hope to do. And uh, despite much greater draws from these sub-basins of uh, Santa Ana and Coyote Creek, uh, the landscape is much drier today. And the creeks used to run year round, they don't run year round anymore. I do know we're in a drought, uh, and, but I really am looking forward to be able to match up those hydrological records and see if my anecdotal memory is, is accurate or not. But I do remember large retention ponds uh, that were full year round. And the landscape today is just much, much drier, but it's been here that way long before the drought. So I think this is something that given where we are, uh, anything that has a chance of improving this watershed function should be, uh, should be explored vigorously. So our current de development goals um, are to be able to treat five to 6,000 acres annually by 2025. That would include the, uh, the Teague watershed, the corridor and other land in the area. We need to have organizational development, not just for ourselves, but how are we gonna structure this whole program as it scales up? Uh, and that's gonna be an, uh, a topic coming up very soon. We also have to launch what we call our tool and, lending, tool and equipment lending program to hopefully work with small and medium grazers to reduce their costs and reduce barriers to entry. Uh, looking at investment for processing infrastructure, not the least which is be cold storage. Uh, and then some workforce development because we need more trained herders. And then finally, re a regional coordination. Uh, this is uh, back in April, we had our first inaugural planning summit. Summit. Many of the people here, Heidi and Tom and others were there um, for that. Uh, here is the pretty much the grazers from our area, not counting uh, Dan Macon over here on the right. Um, and so we looked at, uh, it was basically a one day planning, uh, brainstorming session from uh, a lot of very smart people. And uh, I think it was a very productive day. And we looked at planning and development and looking at this transferable framework and other strategies involving how to overcome barriers. Just some shots from it. It was hosted by Thatcher uh, and uh, facilitated by Legacy Works Group. We are looking at doing a second summit, uh, going after the funding now to do that. Uh, and this one is more of a stakeholder gathering and also looking at the structural issues uh, that we have in terms of how to organize this and have the legal structure as we scale up. So coming near the end here, we have our, um, our many uh, goals that we have. And so um, we did not receive funding this first round of CAL FIRE to pursue the uh, vigorous mapping of the corridor. Uh, hopefully that's only a matter of time. 
Uh, on the other hand, it's probably a blessing because we got so many other projects right now, probably might overload us, but we are uh, moving towards uh, steadily these other goals. And finally, uh, the Hawaii Valley Fire Safety Council has a new office, uh, the first for this uh, modest uh, uh, little organization. So anybody who's in town, please come by. Uh, and uh, we're hosting a number of uh, uh, projects here with Ventura Regional uh, Fire Safety Council. Uh, so uh, we are moving forward. And with that, for more information, contact me, and, for, and then I'll open it up to questions. Okay, thank you, Chris. <laughs> Thanks for including those amazing pictures of me in the slides. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, you're in there a lot, aren't you? Hey, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you are. It's like, who's controlling this big photographing session here? Anyhow, so. <laughs> so does anyone have any questions? I'll give you guys a minute here. And let me check the Q&A. Um, just a general question, will a recording of this meeting be made available? Yes, it will. Um, I am currently recording right now. Um, I have a question, Chris, just kind of going off of our previous presentation. Um, do goats and beavers, do they eat different things? I guess so, because goats don't go after trees, really. They really do. I mean, goats are browsers and they're not really grazers. So they do low uh, feed on low lying limbs and things like that, but they generally do not actually chew through the tree, to my knowledge. I will say that what we are finding is a growing body of, of, uh, of research indicating that properly, and that's the key, properly prescribed grazing uh, in an area that, you know, that it's proper to do so, because this is not for, you know, it's not a panacea. By any, by you know, it's just something that will work in certain areas uh, that it seems to improve actually habitat. People worry about the the animals tromping on things, but they're finding that with properly prescribed grazing, that bird populations come back. Uh, that in something like around the Teague watershed, Tom pointed this out to me a while ago, that uh, that kind of grazing can actually improve the uh, forbs, which gives more pollinator habitat. Uh, and these animals are actually quite sensitive to uh, species on the ground. So we're finding that habitats are actually improved, uh, including riparian zones uh, where there's actually a rebound of this. And so um, I would think that uh, the, the two species would be compatible. That's, uh, that's an unscientific opinion from, uh, from me. Just your observations, that's fine. Just my observation. Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> So we're going to take our break now, everyone. Um, I'll give you guys 10 minutes. So we will resume at 1013. All right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.
Hi, Michael. Um, should I promote Devin to a panelist as well? Oh, you're muted. I think it automatically mutes you guys. There you go. Uh, yes. Why don't we go ahead and add him as well? Okay. And Vivon, I think I made Tom a panelist as well. I don't know if you guys were co-presenting or if he was just supporting you. <laughs> Oh, you're muted also, Vivon. <laughs> Thanks. That sounds good. Um. <laughs> good morning. And I'm here to help if y'all need anything from me. Jamie would love if you chime in because you've been a part of this whole thing. That'd be great. Well, I am part of it, but um well you're definitely more familiar with it than me, Jamie. So <laughs> yeah, so if you if you um if there's a place for me to step in and give a few words about local stuff, then I'm more than happy to. Um I don't know what however it fits with the format. And the same thing with you, Vivon, as well. And we're gonna start in just a minute. I told people 10, 13, so true to my word. Yeah, those those potty breaks are very, very important. So I appreciate it. Hey, I it. needed it, okay, I needed it. Exactly, that's how it is. It's like, I know with this group of people, there's gotta be somebody else besides me who needs to go to the bathroom. So. <laughs> or at least get a drink of water or something. Okay, so it is 1013 now. So we are gonna resume the meeting. Um, first up, we have Vivon from, well, I'll let you kind of introduce yourself, I suppose. You'll probably do a better job than me. I don't wanna misspeak, but I wanna thank you so much for joining us today. And yeah, we're really looking forward to hearing what you have to present about. Wonderful. Thanks, Heidi. Um, hi, uh, as Heidi mentioned, my name is Vivon Crawford. I am the Restoration Program Director at the Ojai Valley Land Conservancy. And today I'm going to share a presentation with you all. I'm going to share my screen. Um, let's see. Oh, Great. Um, and so can everyone see the PowerPoint? Let's make that a PowerPoint. Yes, I can see your screen. Great. Um, let's go to slideshow. There we go. Wonderful. Um, okay. And so, uh, yes, I am Vivon Crawford from the Ojai Valley Land Conservancy, and I'm going to share um, a presentation with you all about the work that we've done um, at the Land Conservancy to map um, Arundo throughout the upper Ventura River watershed um, and our plans to uh, eventually completely eradicate it from the watershed. Um, so without further ado, um, I'll walk you all through um, what we've done so far. So let's see, there we go, excellent. So. Um, invasive Arundo, um, we all know um, a bit of what it is considering we, we all are from this watershed, so we've seen it around. Um, it has a lot of pretty negative impacts um, in our really sensitive riparian zones. Um, and so, you know, it outcompetes native vegetation like sycamores and willows. Um, it diminishes habitat quality. Um, it's really, you know, it really doesn't provide much of anything. It's a pretty dense um, and takes over in one um, as one dense kind of mat 
Um, and it's really, really productive. It uh, generates a ton of biomass that just keeps growing and dying off, um, which makes it a huge fire risk. Um, and it also really creates uh, favorable um, conditions um, for homeless encampments, which make it really complicated for firefighters to fight fires. Um, so, you know, if a fire breaks out within the Arundo, um, you know, they have to take additional precautions there. Um, and also, you know, they're super flammable. They can blow flames like a mile away. Um, it's pretty, pretty scary. Um, and they also use a ton of water. Um, some estimates are as high as 20 acre feet per acre each year, um, you know, in our watershed. Uh, who knows if that factor, if that um, number makes a lot of sense, but that, um, but that is the figure that a lot of people go by. Um, and then finally, um, it really increases um, flooding risks downstream, right? So, um, the flood hazards downstream, um, if these kind of big dense mats kind of dislodge from the stream bank, um, they can you know, flow downstream and clog infrastructure. Um, and so that's, uh, that's, that can be a huge issue downstream as well. Um, and just a quick picture of what it looks like, you know, on uh, on our, you know, sensitive riparian habitats. Um, you can see there on the stream bank, it's really uh, heavily eroded um, right after they removed a lot of those dense mats. But you can see those kind of rhizomes, uh, those really thick roots systems, those are still intact there. But just, you know, a year later, you're looking at, you know, natural recruitment happening um, in that same area once you kind of remove that really big um, that really big dense um, uh, cover there. So um, it really opens that up and creates space for uh, more healthy native vegetation. Um, and so since we all kind of know a bit about Arundo, um, I wanted to give you guys a bit um, about what we did at OVLC. So back in 2021, um, OVLC mapped um, all of the riparian corridors of the upper watershed. So that was everything from Foster Park um, up to the um, Matillaha Dam and then all of San Antonio Creek, um, a good portion of Lion Creek and Thatcher and Reeves Creek as well. Um, so all those tributaries. Um, this work was funded by um, the Wildlife Conservation Board's Ventura River In-Stream Flow Program um, administered by the RCD. So thank you all so much for all your support on that. Um, and uh, from our uh, surveys, we were actually able to identify uh, 36, um, we were able to survey 36 and a half miles of riparian corridor and identified a total of 69 acres of Arundo remaining in the upper watershed. Um, and to give you a sense of what this kind of mapping look of what the resolution of this imagery was, I'll give you a little video um, flyover of a pretty dense patch of Arundo. Um, this is down on the lower portion of the Ventura River, um, and you can see it's just totally choked up there, um, completely filled in that entire channel area. Um, so. Yeah, and so this can kind of show you um, just a flyover. So in addition to all of the photography that we were able to take, so we took individual photos and stitched them all together. But in addition to that, we also did these kind of fly um, video flyovers as well to spot check and make sure um, that all the Arundo that we were identifying was actually Arundo. Um, we also complemented that with um, you know spot checking in the field as well to make sure that we had kind of the best data that we could get. And let's see, uh, next slide. So I wanna take you all um, into um, a place that you all could actually access this data yourself. So one part of the whole project that we were really hoping um, to do was um, gather really great data and make it accessible to anyone who might be interested in this data or might uh, find some use for it. Um, so we can actually go into that data viewer here. Um, and use that login. Um, and just to give you all a sense, um, and all of uh, the link to this and the login, the guest login and information can uh, will be distributed after the meeting for anyone to take a look at this themselves. Um, you can always send me an email if you're interested. Um, but let's see. 
Each of these grid squares is a one square mile survey plot that was done. Um, so we can actually zoom in down here um, at the bottom down at Foster Park. Oh, I'm on Sulphur Mountain. So here we can kind of get down into it and you can see how we actually created layers to identify that Arundo as well. So you can actually see um, that separate from other types of vegetation. Um, so that is something that is really helpful about this really high resolution data. Um, and it is you know, an interactive thing. You can also look at those videos I mentioned there um, and all of that's accessible online for um, anyone who might be interested. Um, and so from there, um, now that we have this really great data, um, we really want to do something good with it. So um, we kind of mapped out a pathway to um, eradicating Arundo completely. We realized that there's only 69 acres left. So, you know, there's, there's actually a future, a realistic future in which we can get rid of all of this, which is really cool. Um, so for us, that was mapping it, uh, permitting, uh, then implementation and ultimately eradication. And we we're hoping that this can be a model that can be translated um, across various different um, across various different watersheds as well, um, and something that could be used to kind of streamline this method. Um, so really, these maps are the foundation for permit coverage. We recently received a grant from Cal Fire's Fire Protection Grant Series um, to get per, uh, programmatic permits um, and CEQA for the entire water uh, for all these areas that we mapped in the watershed to treat and remove Arundo. Um, so we're able to do that and also uh, utilize those permits to start to kickstart kind of these. Um, this effort um, at Foster Park because we were able to kind of do really quick outreach to the county, um, which has really been great. Um, so these programmatic permits are really great because we can use them right away for projects immediately, but it'll also be really great to do more efficient and strategic removals across the watershed. Now that we have if we have permit coverage, we're able to go look for more grant funding to do removal, um, and we're actually able to identify what landowners have Arundo on their properties and do some outreach to them and say, hey, you know, um, we would love to help you get rid of this. Um, what, like, what do you need from us? And so that makes it a really great um, opportunity for OVLC to really take charge and make sure that we can get rid of all this Arundo. Um, and so our next steps, um, we got the grant, which is great. Um, and so now we're gonna go and get to work. Um, we're going to go look for, we're going to start doing all that due diligence for the permit coverage that we need. Um, but one thing that's really cool at this moment in time is uh, California Natural Resources Agency's Cutting the Green Tape Initiative. Um, cutting the Green Tape is really is really intended to help streamline permitting and expedite permitting for restoration projects on a small scale and on a large scale, just like this. Um, so we're really hoping to do some outreach to um, a lot of different agencies to kind of get their involvement and utilize this um, project and our watershed as um, kind of a model for what cutting the green tape can do for restoration. Um, and so from my you know, cursory understanding of cutting the green tape, I'm not an expert. So uh, any very in-depth questions on this, I may not be able to answer, I'm gonna preface, but um, these are the pathways that we understand that our project would would be eligible for um, and would kind of expedite the different permits that we would need to get down the line. Um, and so, yeah, um, that's kind of the, the next steps for us here. We're hoping to, you know, lock in all of these permits over the next two years um, and kickstart things for uh, implementation and ultimately eradication. For that, any questions um, or comments? So if you have a question, please, um, you can do like the virtual raise your hand that I cannot see you guys. You can also use the chat and the Q&A feature. I'm not, oh, someone used the Q&A feature. So someone's asking, what is the geographical area of your programmatic permit with CDFW? Um, that's a really great question. So as of right now, um, our, our, uh, as of right now, our permits 
uh, process that we're looking at is just for the area that we mapped, which is all of the riparian areas upstream, um, Foster Park and up, um, and upstream all the way up to the dam. Um, we are looking into the potential to extend um, these permits down to the coast for the final six miles. Um, but we do acknowledge that like the environmental conditions and um, down there are really different and the stands of Arundo down there are extremely different. So um, we may have to go through a, a slightly different permit process or maybe you know add additional best management practices to our permits if that's what we wanna do. Um, but that is something that we're looking at right now is extending it for the entire watershed. What's the word? And then we have another question of what is the anticipated timeline to secure the permits? That's a great question. Uh, as of right now, it's two years, but we are really hoping to get this done faster than that um, since we do have such great data and um, the team that we're working with is really, uh, in, is really experienced in our watershed. So um, we have a lot of kind of foundation to work off of, which is really cool. So we're hoping to get it done a little faster than two years. Awesome. Well, I think that's all I'm seeing coming in. Let me check the participant list. Okay, so those are our questions. So thank you so much, Ravon. And we will be um, sending out that link to the story map um, later, <laughs> later after the meeting. So thank you so much. Great. Thank you all. And Michael, are you ready? Yes, we are. Uh, and I think it'll actually be a combination of Devin and me speaking to these slides today. Okay, thank you. In fact, and it probably makes sense for Devin to do the initial kickoff, but Devin, I'll go ahead and share my screen and, and so we can go through the presentation. Okay, thanks. So I'm I'm Devin Bass. I'm the executive director for the Upper Sinus Los Tablas Resource Conservation District. And uh, Michael and I have been working together for about a year now uh, on developing this program we call the Sustainable Land Initiative. Um, and it's a way to help us uh, RCD staff um, work with landowners to sort of um, identify projects. And we'll go through a little bit more in detail about what that is. But um, Michael came to me a year ago saying, hey, how can I help you? I work for an international company that's a process based company. Um, and how do RCDs operate? You know, how can we make it so that you're getting more um, projects done on the ground without all the, I guess, sort of the hurdles, the bureaucratic and financial permitting, et cetera, hurdles that come with doing projects. And we kind of walk through a whole different list of things. And Michael is really interested in, in uh, what we call beaver dam analogs. Uh, and I kept saying, well, you know, I, I want to talk about that, but I also have these carbon farm plans I'm really trying to get um, going as well. And through our process, uh, we kind of identified that we can do most of what goes into a carbon farm plan in a pretty short amount of time. Um, and it was kind of nice to have Michael help us sort of walk through what are those steps that we need to do. And, and those who aren't familiar with carbon farm plans, uh, essentially, it's basically a, a, an assessment tool uh, to identify the amount of carbon that could be sequestered by doing um, conservation practices. If you put compost on somebody's land, how much carbon is actually going into the soil that would help reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So. RCDs across the state are trying to work on developing more opportunities for that, um, but it's a slow process. It takes a long time, and um, we see the real need to actually, if we're going to deal with uh, climate change, the, a need to sort of expedite that whole process. So that's where Michael and I partnered and have come to this point. We just launched this whole program, uh, the Sustainable Land Initiative, back in June. Um, and right now we have uh, Upper Salinas, which is in San Luis Obispo County. Um, we have Kachuma interested and Ventura has been partnering. So Jamie and Desiree from Ventura County RCD have been partnering with us and working with us to sort of get this off the, the ground and get it in, implemented. So the idea here was, you know, if we could expand our ability to meet with landowners and quickly and rapidly identify a lot of things we already do and put it into implementation projects, um, we would really see a lot of more momentum um, and a lot more um, projects just implemented on the ground. So there's a lot of funding that's available to do this stuff right now, which is great, um, but it's a grant process. So anybody that's familiar with writing a grant, uh, you know, you wait until they say, hey, here's your six week, 10 week, 12 week window to write one, you submit it, you're competing against 
either your counterparts, the people across the entire state, whatever it is. Um, and then you have to wait and find out that you got awarded and then you have to wait for a grant agreement. So that, that whole process sometimes can take anywhere between three months to a year, depending. Um, no guarantees. So if I meet with the landowner um, and I tell them we're going to write a grant, I usually tell them, give me about a year until we get the funding just to start the project. Uh, and then once we get the funding, then there's a process of working through the contracts, developing the designs, um, you know, trying to get things uh, scheduled to actually do. Um, so every single step in that process just really kind of slowed things down. So generally speaking, I tell people, uh, yeah, and this is actually where we're going is uh, generally speaking, a, a single landowner, single project could take three years just to get to the point where we're implementing it for pretty straightforward things too. And, you know, Michael was asking a lot of good uh, poignant questions like, why is it taking so long? Um, is it, it when you meet with the landowner, do you, you know, have a lot of time to just spend reviewing what they have? And I said, no, usually, you know, in a, uh, a normal site visit, we have like 80 to 90% of the materials we need. It's just there's all these steps along the way that uh, we have to go through to make that happen. So the idea behind the Sustainable Land Initiative uh, is that, one, we can um, aggregate all these and consolidate them all into a, a workable uh, database that we can share with counterparts and other RCDs, staff. Uh, you know, we can come in and out and get involved in the, in the development of uh, what we call the Resource Conservation Plan, which is like a carbon farm plan light. Um, and then it gives the landowners an opportunity to see here's all the different funding opportunities that can align with multiple different conservation practices. So uh, if we went and did a site visit, we identified 10 projects and they said, you know, these three are the most important to me. Uh, then it's up to my staff to say, we actually know there's funding for these first two, this third one, not right now, but we can come back to it uh, when we have uh, a grant application that opens up. Um, so that's really where we're at right now. Um, we would launch this in June. We've done about five site visits um, and already, yeah, Michael's pulling up. Um, we identified 16 eco sites. Um, out of that uh, five site visits, we've done about, I have like 39 different projects. Um, and just to give everybody kind of an understanding, normally that would be one site visit, one project, one grant, wait a year, implement three years. Um, right now where we're at, we're actually getting interest from a lot of different funding sources that are saying, we have money, um, can you connect us with landowners? So uh, it, it is great because um, again, this is really to try and deal with climate change, uh, climate impacts, make agricultural uh, uh, farms uh, more sustainable um, and improve over, overall watershed health. Um, and with that, I'm gonna kind of pause and let Michael talk more about sort of the process and how he got there. Thanks, Devin. Um, just uh, for context, this is really what we've started to build is a fully digitalized process that enables resource conservation districts to do what they're already doing, but to accelerate it and to take all of that knowledge that they're capturing and opening it up and making it available to others so that it can become uh, accessible for grant funding. Um, and so it can just increase the likelihood of securing those grants. So when it really, when the rubber reads the road, this is what it kind of looks like, is it's a, a standard intake form for landowners to submit an interest saying that they, they want to become more sustainable. Uh, it should take them no more than five minutes to complete. And all the information in there is what's going to be critical for an RCD to then assess, should we come out and do a site visit? RCDs are already doing these site visits. Now, when they come out and do them, they actually have a standard template that they can capture all the necessary information that is going to be required down the road for them to either feed into a grant, be that healthy soils or SGMA or any of those other grants, um, but also to assess what the potential environmental value is of those different projects. And then we empower the landowner to then to look at all these potential projects and say, here's what my priorities are. Here are the things that I want to do because of the ability to improve soil, to reduce fire risk, uh, to increase water retention, um, whatever their goals may be. Right now, the, uh, we are in the process of testing it. So as Devin mentioned, over the last six weeks, we did about five site visits. The focus of those site visits is really to continue to enhance this process, to make it as easy as, as possible. Um, but as Devin was starting to say, what was taking over a year just to get to, we've now done five times in just a matter of weeks. 
Um, and ideally where we really want to be is to do what was taking a year, boil that down to a single day of work. So one day of work, capture everything that's necessary and pull it together into a standard format resource conservation plan, or what we were calling almost like a carbon farm plan light that is really simple and captures all of the information necessary that will enable the landowner to make good decisions, but also enable the resource conserv or the RCDs to then go after those grants and attach that as supporting evidence. But the real value to me is that it's creating what we're calling this inventory of environmental opportunities. So you can then look across an RCDs area or an entire region and say, hey, we want to do something around greenhouse gas reduction. Well, you can quickly identify and search across all of those different site visits and say, here are the 15, 20, 30, 50 different projects that meet those criteria and enable you to go after grants more efficiently and effectively. And you have all the scientific evidence documented to back it up and increase the chances of it. Uh, we did a site visit uh, last week where we said, hey, here's some opportunities for prescribed grazing. Here are some opportunities for repairing restoration. Uh, we actually were down in Ventura and saw a whole bunch of that Arundo. So thank you. And we started saying, how do we get rid of this? So it's a, now building a resource conservation plan around that particular location that says, here's the opportunities that we can do. And then being able to tie that together to more efficiently go after the funding necessary to make it happen. Now that you have all that information, well, now we can really start to tap into those funding mechanisms. I think what we've been hearing over and over is that there's a lot of money out there. But what they don't have is a list of, if it, between a lot of different grant programs, um, NGOs and others willing to support these endeavors, but they do not currently have shovel ready projects. Well, now we're building this huge inventory and meeting that supply side that says, here are the environmental projects that are scientifically backed that will meet your needs, whatever those needs are from a grant uh, provider opportunity, uh, a grant provider's perspective. And now that, now that you're going after this as a group and uh, in unison, well, it also increases the chances to implement it. One of the pain points we saw previously was that when we were doing individual grants for one landowner, they oftentimes did not have the equipment to actually implement it. Let's say they wanted to, for example, put compost on their land. Well, we were able to even identify free compost for them. We could get that compost delivered to them for free. But then once that compost was on site, the landowner did not have the resources to potentially distribute it. They didn't have a compost spreader. So the, the, the process would fall flat. Either the landowner would have to get their own compost spreader or identify one. Well, now as we're starting to go after this more seamlessly, we could say, how do we help implement this? Can we, for example, do regional equipment shares? Can Devon's RCD, for example, does not have a compost spreader, but one of the RCDs next door does. You can start to utilize each other's equipment and or build up this regional equipment share so that it is available for these projects as they are rolling out. It also allows the RCD to stay involved throughout to provide some of that expertise to make it really happen. And then finally, it really accelerates the ability to use partners and NGOs. Um, so as Devin mentioned before, uh, I think it was one tree planted just reached out and said, hey, we would like to do a, a lot of uh, new plantings, particularly around repairing corridors. What do you have? Devin, I'm going to do my best to kind of quote uh, you here, or maybe you want to add in comments on this point. Yeah, I mean, the, the, that conversation started off with, you know, uh, one tree planter was just interested in what we, uh, the RCDs are doing. And through that that sort of discussion, uh, I mentioned we did a couple of site visits and we already had um, acreages on different properties identified. And so in basically within 15 minutes, I could send them a consolidated list of here's the potential um, opportunities for them to implement and, and fund projects. That normally, like I said, would have taken a lot longer process to do. And so now I can really help landowners connect with funding sources that want to do things, uh, conservation practices. Yeah, it, it's when we come down to one particular value add, it's really just accelerating the speed at which we are combating climate impacts. Um, it's bringing down the costs. It's also improving the quality, but really it's allowing our CDs to achieve more, more rapidly. Uh, and then finally, there's the measure and certify portion of this. And that because everything is being handled within this one system, it allows you to quickly go back and do the monitoring and measure what your actual impact is. Now we're trying to tie this into an overall regional uh, methodology that would allow um, either 
the cities, counties, others who might be funding some of these initiatives to be able to then account for what has uh, what they were accomplished. So because the RCDs can document all this, they can quickly generate a report that says, here are the 15 projects, or here are the 15 locations, for example, that we put compost on you know, throughout the county. Well, that's gonna tie directly into state bill 1383 that, uh, that tries to uh, capture organic waste and put it back on farmer's land. Every county uh, across California is required to, to, to um, to do this based on their population base, but they need a way of actually monitoring and tracking it. Same is true for CEQA and eventually for carbon markets. So our goal is really to, to, to continue to just accelerate the speed and the ease at which we can justify and achieve our environmental goals. Um, but overall, what we're seeing is that landowners, um, they're able to adopt sustainable practices more efficiently and effectively, uh, and they're improving uh, the they're improving the value of their land in many different environmental ways. The RCDs are able to accelerate the speed of their implementation. Um, and then municipalities and counties, they're really gaining a means of rapidly accomplishing whatever their environmental goals are, um, while at the same time benefiting landowners and not subjugating them to uh, additional green or red tape, so to speak. So from there, um, I think we'll, we'll open it up to any questions that you may have. Thank you. Um, Jamie, did you want to add anything for um, like the local RCD side? Um, thanks. Yeah, I think I could um, add just a few words. Um, Michael and Devin, I appreciate you taking the time to introduce this initiative to the group. Um, as Devin indicated, uh, this is relatively new. Um, and so we're one of the partners, one of the RCD partners, um, looking to um, leverage uh, this initiative to help with um, local and regional projects. Um, I want to point to one of Devin's earlier comments about One Tree Planted. Um, turns out that we have an oak restoration project that um, we introduced to One Tree Planted based on the conversation that Devin had with them. And so um, they're looking to help provide some match funding for that project that's gonna be occurring um, here locally. So that's just one example just happened within the last two weeks of how the partnerships and the, and the conversations um, around this initiative have led to um, direct benefits to um, our our region. However, uh, one of the true values um, that I see, at least in the immediate future, uh, with this initiative, um, and Michael sort of touched on it uh, earlier, is sort of the aggregation of potential projects um, and the quick methodology in which um, each of these projects uh, and each of the conservation practices embedded within these projects um, can be parsed so that you can sort of filter and sort according to what the landowner priorities are so that they match up with funding opportunities. And so as a first step in making sure that we have scale to go after you know, large block grants, given that the state is gonna have quite a bit of money coming its way that's gonna go into the various um, conservation leaning agencies, it's good to have sort of these uh, aggregated projects across regions and across landscapes available um, to demonstrate that you can effectively disperse these state funds to achieve practices that the state um, and the local landowners feel are important. So, um, you know, things that were mentioned earlier, such as uh, the CDFA Healthy Soils Program, uh, the city FA sweep program, um, certainly helping landowners in the county uh, help the, the county and the state achieve the, AB, the SB 1383 goals um, of diverting organic material from landfills um, to reduce methane emissions is, a, is a, something that I'm, I'm hoping that we'll help with. Um, and then other, you know, uh, restoration, conservation practices and projects. Uh, the landowners would be willing to do. This is just a great way of databasing all of that 
um, and making it available to any funders um, and to RCD staff who, who are going to be applying for funds. And the last one I want to make is that um, in terms of aggregating projects, the local RCDs, for example, Ventura or San Luis Obispo um, RCDs, uh, have the ability within the database to sort of keep everything um, private. So, you know, everything can stay local to the extent that um, we partner, um, you know, the allocation of, of information or, or the availability of information is going to um, be able to be channeled to just um, whoever is directly interested or needs access to it. So there's a lot of power um, and potential embedded in this initiative. And I appreciate that uh, Michael and Devin reached out to um, sort of partner with us and, and get our feedback and um, give us the opportunity to actually implement here locally. So those was probably a few more words than I should have spoken, but um, I appreciate the opportunity to chime in. Thanks. And then I also saw that um, I think I think Tom, you have you have a question. It shows you're unmuted, so you can talk. Uh, yeah, hi, Devin. Uh, I used to work with DJ a little back when I was working for the Nature Conservancy in Slow. Um, is the is the limiting uh, there's a lot of power to the aggregation elements and the, the sort of internal systems but is the limiting factor more acutely the um the landowner involvement or is this is this facilitating landowner involvement and then and then part of landowner involvement that i think is sometimes a little bit of a fly in the ointment is the land tenure agreements that have to go with some of these practices so if you could address that it'd be great yeah, no, that's, I mean, a couple of those things. That's one of it, getting more landowner engagement. So I was just out on a site visit yesterday um, and the landowner basically wanted me to come out to their vineyard and look at some of their oaks, uh, oak trees and see what's going on. Uh, they had a piece of ground that said uh, that's they're following and they're kind of like, we could do something with them. Like, well, we could put an oak woodland uh, management plan together and an oak woodland restoration and I can get that funded through one tree planted. That normally would have taken a lot longer. So uh, again, that that whole conversation happened within 20 minutes. Um, normally, that would take me a couple months. Um, I think as people get more familiarized with the Sustainable Land Initiative and how they can engage with it, uh, it'll be more uh, landowners coming to the table. I think the thing that's difficult is when we get a grant solicitation um, that comes out, we have to sort of do some preliminary outreach, like how many people would be interested in this. Um, and and it's a rapid run turnaround to try and get everything pulled together, all this information consolidated and put in a in a competitive application, really. Um, so I, I think um, you'll hear more people being interested in in uh, a way to partner with RCDs when we make it simpler for them to do so, and it less of a burden. One of the things that Jamie mentioned was the Healthy Soils program through CDFA. Uh, most RCDs have a way to be able to help landowners write uh, applications to that program. But it, it's usually one of these things where um, there's a window and you get 20 people that come in your door saying, I need you know two hours of your time. It's a capacity issue for some of us. Um, we just can't meet everybody's needs. And so some people kind of fall off the wayside. If we were doing this earlier on and meeting with people and consolidating all their uh, conservation goals and interests, then when we do get those uh, solicitations that says, you know, meet with these many, uh, you know, as many landowners as possible, We'll have a lot of that work already prepared, and so we can actually make make more people um, in in you know writing applications and getting involved in, in programs like that. So, and then the second part of your question, I'm actually already forgot. <laughs> I'm so oh, it's just this, you know, sometimes if you get funding from WCB, you know, there's a 20 year oh, monitoring yeah, yeah. thing, or and that yeah. I you know I know the I know your district up there, and yeah. I could see I could see some folks bridling at that up in the. East Paso yeah. area, for instance. Yep, and, uh, and that's true, and and that's uh, that's a difficulty with a lot of the sort of typical grant programs is they do have some sort of requirement. That's one of the things I try and promote is that our RCD will work with the landowners to to implement and manage those uh, contracts. Um, and some of those things were yes, uh, it's a, it's a no go for them because they don't want to have a ten year agreement. Um, then that's where it's up to my staff to look for another funding source that might be more palatable. Um, so if I took that example of the oak 
woodland management and it, if I went to WCB and they had a two year um, requirement to, to have access to that property and that was not going to work for the landowner, I might go to one tree plan and say, would this be, you know, uh, something you guys would be willing to fund and would this work well for the landowner? So that's that's some of the stuff that we kind of do in the backdrop that makes it easier for landowners to, to get the resources that they need to do the conservation goals that they want to achieve. And then one, while well, I got the floor here, one last question, you know, there's a lot on climate. Um, what about biodiversity? Yeah, actually, I, I, while we're sitting here doing our presentation, I'm going through all the practices and I'm identifying how all these different practices have multi-benefits. So uh, we have uh, four categories and I just added another one, which is the four were soil, water, habitat, and ag sustainability. Um, so as an example, if we implemented beaver dam analogs, um, that would improve water, habitat, and maybe ag sustainability. But also I just added a fifth category, which would be fire risk management. So the, the goal here, uh, Tom, is that I'm trying to be able to say, when a landowner comes to me and says, what can we do on my property? I can come back to them with a list of practices and they can see the benefits realize that if one of their goals is to try and improve biodiversity, um, they may prioritize their, their practices and what they wanna do based on that. Um, some may not necessarily be, that may not be the, the forefront of their decision-making process, but if they know that they're doing something that's beneficial overall, um, then they'd be certainly more interested in doing so, especially if it's easier to implement for them. Yeah, cool, thanks. Yep. And uh, a quick clarification, if I could, please. Um, Tom, with respect to your question about uh, landowner, um, uh, my hope would be that we would um, do outreach that would then, because this is an entirely online system. And so um, it's database driven and so, outreach about um, any of these uh, fundable programs looking for landowners, we can simply um, allow access to a link that would link them to submit a form that would then become a sequence of events that would schedule site visits and inputs of um, all the potential actions to be taken on their land. So we're hoping that it'll open up um, the floodgates for people to sort of let us know what they're interested in. And then that will go in back to what Devin said allow us to schedule everything accordingly so that things fall into place by the time it's um, it's time to apply for funds for the various uh, programs. Um, so hopefully there'll be wide access to all. Um, the tenure question is one that kind of um, comes down to what specific program that they're actually gonna apply oh. to. And that's oh, usually no, worked out after the fact. No, and I, I've been on both sides of that tenure question, mm -hmm. honestly. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. To the audience, to the local audience, please um, um, take note that hopefully uh, outreach events will be happening sooner than later um, so that you can have access to sort of this um, this uh, entryway into this database. Yeah, and I should mention that our website, we actually do have a way so you can actually fill out um, the intake form and, and you can decide whether you're in Ventura, uh, I think San Luis, uh, Coastal San Luis or Upper Salinas through that intake form. Thank you. Okay, I think those are all the questions we have for this presentation. So thank you guys so much for um, sharing your time with us and presenting. And next we are going to have Lynn Rodriguez. She's going to share some updates with us. Um, Lynn, are you, you said you needed to present. Are you able to share your screen? Yep, there you go. You're on it. Okay, awesome. <laughs> Yeah, good morning, everyone. Um, let me just put this in slideshow mode. That worked. Um, I, I've been really appreciating the conversation today and um, particularly the way uh, several of you have highlighted the role the RCDs are playing in land management and, and a lot of uh, programmatic areas that relate to the work that I do in integrated regional water management. And I just wanna thank you, RCDs in general, but the RCD in Ventura County in particular, for the, the role you play. I mean, coordinating this watershed is only one small part of, of what you're doing. And um, I really appreciate that you're hearing more about the um, method you've come up with for people to submit project ideas so that it moves quickly at the time of uh, funding coming available. As some of you, or maybe most of you know, the IRWM program is an example of a very slow 
and not always ready, you know, not nimble the way it's not really intended to be, but um, I think having the system set up that you're describing is really going to be great for the future of, of programs in the county. So I just wanted to make that comment. Um, so for those of you that don't know me, my name is Lynn Rodriguez. I'm the manager of the Watersheds Coalition of Ventura County Integrated Regional Water Management Program. And I wanna give you a couple of updates. It's been a while since I've um, told you about some of the things going on in the region. So um, here's just a little bit of an overview of what I'm gonna cover, um, focusing mostly on round two of Prop 1 IRWM funding, the last round of funding that has been secured through legislation and, and voter approved bonds. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the recent close for, of, uh, for the call for projects, the projects that were submitted for this watershed some upcoming meetings and decisions and process. And then um, just wanted to also mention, actually the updated website isn't that related to Prop 1, but, um, and then some other funding opportunities as previous speakers mentioned, there's so much money flowing out right now from the state on climate resilience, water management, um, habitat, um, all, you know, green infrastructure or um, nature-based solutions. So it's hard to keep up with it. It's certainly hard to chase after all that money when you've got a lot of other things on your plate. So, but I do like to still make sure people understand what's out there and what might be coming. And then a quick update on the Water Talks program, uh, which is our disadvantaged community involvement and engagement program funded also by Prop 1. Um, oh, this is leftover. We did a briefing for uh, Prop 1 back in June. Some of you attended that meeting. Um, and it's just nice once in a while to take a look at what we've been able to accomplish as a region um, with funding and support from IRWM grants, uh, 42 projects and $94 million of um, state investment. And then of course, a lot larger investment on the local end. Um, so pretty exciting accomplishment for our region. Um, those of you that submitted projects are well familiar with these, the guidelines in the PSP for this program. So I'm not gonna go over that. Um, just a highlight for those of you that didn't attend the briefing, um, this last round of funding, you know, each round of, this is our seventh round of IRWM implementation grants, each round gets a little easier. This one is even more simplified for us because we've come to agreement with the other IRWM regions in our funding area to not compete, but to actually, we agreed in advance on how much money we'll each be getting, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but we do get some benefits from that, uh, more streamlined application. Um, and well, these are things mostly project proponents need to know, but um, here's the results of our negotiation with our neighboring IRWM regions. The $34.3 million we have for this final round for our funding area, the Watersheds Coalition negotiated a 25% share of that, which works out to 8.57 million. There's a set aside, a larger set aside for DAC only projects than there was in round one so that we could complete the disadvantaged community involvement process and needs assessments. And so that amount of money is 60% of the total that was available in Prop 1. And it is, um, again, we've kind of negotiated a softer um, limit. We can negotiate around that depending on what the projects that come out of it are, but we're going to roughly get 25% of that 6.37 million, which is about $1.9 million. Um, one other thing about this being the last round of funding, any projects in round one that didn't get completed, that money or, or dropping off, that money moves forward to round two. <clears throat> and uh, it's possible that we'll have a project that will boost our amount above. And each region from which that um, incomplete project comes from will get that additional money rolled into their share. Uh, we also, this time, are going to be putting backup projects on our list. So as we consider that there were 12 projects submitted for round two, um, as we consider those, we'll also be identifying backup projects in case any of the primary projects drop out for some reason. Um, a reminder that there's a 50% cost share for these projects. If you're not a DAC, there's a, a waiver of that match if you're a DAC project. Um, and um, eligible costs after January 1st of 2015 can be reimbursed. So that's goes back a ways, the beginning of Prop 1. 
So uh, we had a call for projects that concluded at 5 p.m. on Monday. I'm still working on you know, reviewing those projects and pulling together some summary data that I can share with each of the watersheds. Um, just wanted to share with you which projects were submitted for the Ventura River watershed. One of them is a regional project, so its benefits go beyond the watershed, and that is an inner tie with um, Cayegas. And you've probably heard about this project by now. There's two phases or two aspects to that project and the Cayegas Municipal Water District is taking one aspect and the city of Ventura is taking the other. Um, this project has been much studied and um, there's been a lot of work done getting to this point, uh, alignments for a pipeline and other elements of the project. We're now ready to move into funding, you know, early phases of the project. So um, that project, the city of Ventura has put forward will be considered. Um, also, um, just so you know, the Cayegas project was is has also been submitted, the Cayegas piece of that project. Um, also for just this watershed, um, the Lake Casitas Veg Vegetative Management Project that was put forward by the Casitas Municipal Water District. Then um, Casitas Municipal Water District also put together a Ventura Santa Barbara intertie project. And these intertie projects are basically water and climate resilience projects and emergency um, backup, if you will, for anything from earthquakes to extended drought to other potential catastrophic interruption in water supply so that um, parts of the region can help one another. You may remember from the last the last really big drought in the late 80s, early 90s, there was an intertie um, created a pipeline distribution mechanism between Casitas and Carpinteria, um, which never actually had to be activated because we had you know, massive rainfall in March of, I think it was 92, and that negated the need for that project. So um, then we have two projects that came forward from the Casitas Mutual Water Company. That entity is a very small um, entity that operates in a disadvantaged community and they are part of our disadvantaged community involvement sort of target area. Um, they have some challenges with lack of adequate fire um, fighting capacity. They need hydrants and, and they also need um, some backup supply through a well rehabilitation that they're proposing. And then the final one is the RCD's Land Resilience Partnership, which I believe is kind of connected to that in-stream flow framework study that's been going on. Um, and um, I don't have, I haven't had a chance to read through that one in total yet, but um, I know that Jamie is on and, and if we wanted, if anybody wants to say anything about any of these projects mm -hmm. before I move on, this is a good chance. Um, on August 23rd, I believe is going to be a special meeting of the watershed council to review those projects and take action on which ones to put forward for consideration in a suite of projects of a proposal for the whole region. Um, so now is probably a good time if you're on the line and you've submitted a project if you want to say a couple of words, um, but we'll get a more full presentation from you at the next meeting. Jamie, did you want to say anything about your project? Thanks, Lynn. Um, yes, very astute. So the Land Resilience Partnership um, was a component uh, that was utilized um, for planning purposes in the Ventura River and Stream Flow Project, uh, which was funded back in 2019 using Prop 1 too. So Prop 1 money sure did, did get spread wide and far. Um, and it was sort of uh, sub aspects of some of the planning projects um, similar to, to um, OVLC's project. Um, I'll say that the LRP, we're hoping to expand on that. Um, and the Land Resilience Partnership is um, really looking at trying to plan and implement climate resilience practices um, at the parcel scale, but to certainly allow that at the landscape scale so that you can aggregate all those um, practice benefits. Things like um, rainwater harvesting, climate uh, um, appropriate plantings, um, gray water use, things that shift the timing and the use of water, particularly in critical um, low stream flow time periods. Um, so right. we're, we're hoping that that uh, additional LRP funds will come through the Wildlife Conservation Board 
<laughs> we have another uh, VRIF2, we call it, planning project going into consideration to WCB this month. Um, and it fits very, very well with sort of the, um, the sustainable land initiative that we discussed earlier. Um, and it continues again, this sort of parcel level, but landscape scale and regional scale um, planning and implementation. Uh, that's the, the heart and soul of, of our WM, really. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jamie. Um, I haven't been able to see who's on the call today. Is there anybody from Casitas Municipal Water District? Nope. I'm not anyone? seeing anyone raising their hand. No. Okay. Anyone from the oh, city wait, of Ventura? Someone did. Oh. Oh, Tyrone. This is Tyrone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yep, I'm here. Did you, is there anything you would want to say about the uh, two Casitas Municipal Water District projects? Um, I, I, I wish I could. I wasn't involved <laughs> with drafting them, unfortunately. I'm, I'm not a very good representative at the moment regarding those, but um, yeah, curious. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, there were a couple other people who raised their hand if you. Um, okay, Kelly yeah. might be on the line too. Yeah, Kelly is here. There okay. you go. She she'd be better better uh, suited to speak to it. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I, Lynn, I think you did a good job uh, kind of summarizing them. I I was under the understanding we would be giving um, presentations later this month, so I didn't have anything fine. necessarily prepared, but. Um, we ha have the Ventura Santa Barbara County Intertie project, which we've been working on the design, and that is a regional interconnection um, between Casitas Municipal Water District and Carpinteria Valley Water District. So it kind of spans two Irwin regions, I would say. Um, but that is a it's a bi-directional pipeline for emergency purposes. Um, and then the Lake Casitas Vegetation Management Project is related to um, the potential water quality issues that we have with the reseeding lake levels. We have um, vegetation um, that has been exposed that would be normally underwater. And that can cause increased organic loading um, in the lake. And require additional treatment um, in order um, once the lake levels come back up. So we're trying to remove that so it doesn't cause problems once once the lake levels do return. Um, so I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to hear on that, but that's just kind of the gist of the, of the two projects. And we'll be happy to give a um, more detailed presentation later this month. Great, thank you, Kelly. I didn't mean to put you guys on the spot. I just, I was starting to talk about your projects and I didn't want to get anything wrong. So I uh, appreciate your clarifying. Uh, um, really quickly, uh, someone else raised their hand. Monica, did you want to share anything or were you just letting us know that um, you were here representing one of the organizations? Hi. My Hello. name is Wang. <laughs> I'm a management analyst with the city of Ventura. Thank you, Lynn, for providing an overview of the Ventura Cayegas interconnection project. Um, so this project would be a pipeline to transport our state water allocation through Cayegas' system to the city of Ventura system. And this project would also allow multiple agencies to receive their state water allocation. Um, this is United and Casitas. And we would also use the water to blend to help improve the city's water quality. And the project would also provide the infrastructure to move water into Cayegas from Ventura in case of an imported water supply outage. And the city of Ventura's portion of the project is a four mile pipeline. And the Cayegas portion is a three mile pipeline. And our general manager, Gina Dorrington, will be presenting this to the council. At the, cool. August, at the August 23rd meeting. Great, that's awesome. Thank you so much for the 
much more clear <laughs> explanation of the project. That's great. Thank you. Um, then the other two projects, and I think I'm just in the interest of time, going to really quickly give an overview on those. The Casitas Mutual Water Company um, has some real challenges, and we've been working actually closely with them through the Disadvantaged Community Involvement Program, and they've gotten some funding um, and some assistance, technical assistance from that. Um, but they have some real, and, and they've also, I believe, gotten the money, some money from the small communities drought relief grant program the state is um, administering, uh, but they really have a need for fire hydrants and for rehabilitation of one of their wells. Uh, so they've submitted those two projects and because they're in a DAC community, they qualify for the free match or ma match waiver for that. Um, so that covers all the six projects that were submitted. And once we have all 12 projects put together in a format that's easy for people to look at and includes cost information, we'll be sharing that with everybody. And then each watershed, I guess I should move on to my next slide. Um, and the timeline, each, each watershed will be meeting over the next uh, three weeks, four weeks. Uh, to consider the projects in their watershed and also any regional projects that would benefit the whole county or multiple watersheds. So, um, as I said, the call for projects concluded August 1st. The committees begin, so today, actually I put August 4th because I thought today was going to be the day this committee was going to meet, and so I need to change that to the 23rd. Uh, the disadvantaged community, um, we are in a little doing something a little different this time, disadvantaged community projects are going to look, be looked at in two ways. One through first the DAC committee, which meets August 17th, but also through um, the area-wide disadvantaged community involvement program task force. And so they have a role in deciding, kind of ultimately giving a thumbs up on the projects that would be submitted for funding in the DAC set aside, the 6.37 million. Um, and that's because we're really trying to stay true to the intent of the DACI grant, which is to better engage underserved community um, members and institutions serving them to make sure that the needs they identified are being addressed. So we have um, some pretty rigorous uh, analysis that we'll be doing, uh, but we also need the DAC committee and the WCDC to weigh in on those DAC projects. So that will be kind of on the parallel inter interjoined process. Um, I understand Cayugas Creek watershed may not actually have a meeting. I think they already have a project selected, maybe only one or two. And then um, Santa Clara River watershed meets on August 25th. So by August 25th, all three watersheds will have determined their projects they would like to put forward. Any projects that don't go forward for the round two proposal for consideration for that, um, you know, will be added to the IR demand plan. You may have noticed that the call for projects included another deadline of September 15th, and that's for any projects that aren't considered appropriate, that people aren't ready for round two or don't want round two funding for, but might want other funding. So we're going to be adding projects to the plan like we did, that, we last did that in 2019. So the final step is the Watersheds Coalition Steering Committee and then the general membership will look at this, the proposed projects from each watershed and come to a decision about which ones to include in the proposal. And the proposal is due February 1st, as you can see on this slide. So, but we need to be done with our assessment of the project or we need to be done with our selection of the projects well in advance of that, you know, by the end of September. So um, it's possible, I mean, it, Previously, the County of Ventura had applied for the grants until round one when Cayugas Municipal Water District took the grant and are administering it. Um, if they get a project approved in this mix, um, they're gonna also request their board to give them permission to take this grant. So, um, and then one more meeting on the sep September 14th is when the area-wide disadvantaged community involvement task force deliberates on the projects. No, just this is just the okay so um we're, we're working out a few kinks but if you were someone that submitted a project in this new portal that we have we have a project input form a lot of information is requested and then i should have updated the slide but if you go to the portal today you'll see red dots for all the projects that were submitted and you click on that dot 
each dot and you can get data about, you know, it's basically the information provided in the form. So in advance of each watershed reviewing the projects and maybe some summary information we provide and guidance on determining which projects are the best fit, you'll be able to look at what people submitted in their form. So stay tuned for more guidance on that. It is, well, anyway, we're working on making it a little more user-friendly, so stay tuned. Oh, and here's a here's an image that shows, this is before all the projects were submitted, but um, some of you went through this process with the form. We will be asking for feedback from everybody that used the form. We did find a few little glitches here and there with word counts that people exceeded because it wasn't clear what the word count was. Um, so I did wanna say just a couple things about the disadvantaged community projects. Um, as I mentioned before, it, this is really kind of a separate process this time in some ways. All the projects that are um, DAC projects were expected to be submitted through the process we just closed. So we know there's only these two projects being submitted. Um, in the watershed that, that that directly benefited DAC. I think other projects are claiming there's a DAC benefit, so we need to look at that and see um, how that will work. Um, and yeah, I guess I've already covered all this. Are there any questions about uh, about Prop One before I move on? Anybody have any any hands raised about what I've just covered? No, there's two hand raised, but um, I think those are from, from previous. Leftover, okay. Yeah. Um, what I put in my list of topics up front that I haven't mentioned yet is we just redid our website. And if you've been looking at the Watersheds Coalition website over the years, you'll see some significant improvements. It's still a work in progress. There's still a few things that need to be added, but there is a prop one section with a lot of information in it that's easier to find than it was on our on our previous website. So I'd love input from folks. If you're looking at the website and you, something's missing or you don't understand something, or if you just wanna say it looks great, that would be awesome. Uh, watershedscoalition.org is the URL. Um, and that last, um, the portal is maps.ventura.org. If you just type that in, it'll pull up the website. Okay, so if there's no other questions or no questions on that, um, the drought relief funding, I just wanted to mention among the many um, funds flowing from the state currently in the budget year that just ended, there, were, uh, there was a fair amount of money for small communities. So like a mutual water company is a good example of that to receive funding for drought relief and also urban and multi-benefit projects, which were more larger scale, also for drought relief. And both of these funding sources were targeting underserved communities. Uh, we were fortunate to receive um, the recommendation from our whole funding area-wide task force because the um, drought relief funding in the urban multi-benefit grant program was being administered through the existing DACI grant. It gets complicated, but uh, we received um, funding for two mutual water company projects in the Nyland Acres community on kind of in El Rio area and for a total of $1.4 million, which is very exciting. Uh, we're moving forward with that. Both of those projects are, um, are uh, one is for a backup well in the Garden Acres Mutual Water Company and land acquisition for that well site. And the other is for a new mainline system, water main system that will um, significantly reduce, reduce leaks in the Nylon Acres Mutual Water Company. Um, we have also, we're tracking the current budget year that just started on July 1st. There's gonna be more multi-benefit and or urban multi-benefit and small community drought relief funding coming forward. And we'll keep you posted on that. There's a lot of funding coming out of Strategic Growth Council on, on um, climate resilience, climate networks. I mean, I, I, I'm having trouble keeping track of it all right now because I'm focused on IRWM grants, but um, I really encourage that you go to the um, grants.ca.gov website, get on their listserv and receive their notices. Um, every Monday, they drop a whole bunch of different grant opportunities there. You can select what kinds of things you're interested in hearing about. So you don't get everything because there's a lot on there, but there's a lot of, um, and even federal funds are located on that site. So 
If you're seeking funding for a specific type of project, I highly recommend that you go there and look and see. But in the meantime, anything that I feel like is specifically really relevant for us on water projects that we're working on or identifying as a need or water related activities, um, we'll be forwarding that to you. Um, a lot of focus on drought relief for obvious reasons. Uh, any question on funding? Oh, I'm out of time. So um, my last slide is just, oops, sorry, I keep flipping my, um, very quickly just wanted to say there's been a lot of activity on the Water Talks program, which is funded by Prop 1, the DACI program. We've posted a lot of information on the Ventura portion of that site. So I recommend that you look at that URL at the bottom. You can go to Ventura County and read um, the results of the needs assessment, see some new fact sheets that were developed for each of the nine communities we're focused on. So that includes the Ventura Avenue and the um, Casitas Mutual Water Company, area, uh, Casitas Mutual, I'm sorry, Casitas Springs. Um, and that area, those two areas have a fact sheet. There's full needs assessment results. We're working on a tribal needs assessment right now and hope to have results for that in the next few months. There's a dashboard that shows where the needs are. I think this is particularly interesting for those of you that are water suppliers um, to see. Um, and then, you know, just thanks to all of the folks that are involved in this grant. It's been a very big effort with a lot of different people involved since 2017. So now we're, you know, closing out the fifth year of our program. So thanks to all of our partners, Cal Rural Water, Cal State University, Cause, and the Friends of the Santa Clara River. And we're currently, and I don't have time to go into this, the details, but we currently do have some technical assistance projects being funded through um, the final phase of that DACI grant and Casita Springs Mutual is one of those um, that's receiving some funding to do design for their um, fire flow upgrade. Any questions on that? I don't see anyone raising their hands. Okay, well, thank you for the opportunity to kind of update you and um, I'll probably do this again in another four months or so. Awesome, thank you, Lynn. Um, so just to tack on to what Lynn said, we will be reviewing the proposals for IRWM in Ventura, the Ventura River watershed on August 23rd. Um, I wanted to see how many projects got submitted before picking a time, but if you did submit a project, does the morning work for you? I mean, raise your hand <laughs> if you if it works or if it doesn't work. Um, please leave it in the chat. Would would 9 a.m. on August 23rd work? We're we're considering um, having it be hybrid. So I, I will reach out to presenters to see um, if they want to come in in the into a building so that we can kind of share and go over the projects so i really am kind of depending on knowing that um, 9 a.m works with 9 a.m on august 23rd work and i think it's important to okay so jamie's saying um he would prefer it to be later so jamie are you thinking in the afternoon um yeah, if I could, I'm just uh, concerned that this is a meeting with the funder about an ongoing grant. So I'm just concerned I might drift into that time. I don't, I don't expect I'll be the only presenter. Um, however, if, if it's okay with others, if we can just move that timeline back a little bit, um, it'd be, it'd be great. And it doesn't have to be, you know, in the afternoon, but if it's maybe at 10 or, or so, um, that'd be fine too. Because other than that, um, I'm fairly clear. That's the only one that it's already been moved once, and I can't. I don't know okay. if I can move it again. <laughs> okay, so um, let's do let's do eleven. Um, does anyone have any issues with August twenty third, eleven a.m. Can I? Can I just suggest that an hour, I mean, if people really don't do want a hard stop at noon, an hour might not be, well, let me just, 
lay this out. When we do this project selection, and Jamie, you kind of managed it last time for round one, we do like to see as many people as possible in the watershed tuning in for that conversation because we don't want just the project proponents voting on their own projects, but also because I think it's important for all the watershed stakeholders to hear about the projects and understand how they and, and vote on how those projects will advance the needs and goals in the watershed. So a couple of parameters, I think doing it when you can get the most people there is important. Of course, you want the project proponents there, but, and then the other thing is, um, you know, give it enough time so that there's good, can be good discussion. And I think I'm certain it was at least two hours the last time we did this and, you know, possibly even longer, or maybe we had two meetings. Jamie, I'm a little rusty on my memory there, but. Um, I am too, it has been a, a while, but um, I, I guess the important point is that there was a lot of feedback and communication for every project. And we didn't pace it so that it was a very, it was static. Like we wanted for those projects that needed a lot of questions, we needed the project proponents and the audience to pose those questions and answer those questions because that was all part of making sure that the project itself was more competitive. Um, and so to the extent that we can provide a more expansive schedule, I think that would benefit the overall project selection process. Um, and I, I can't remember, obviously I could probably look back through my schedule and see what we ended up doing, but um, did we cap the presentations to like 20 minutes or so and then gave probably so, an equal amount of time just for questions and answers? No, it was more like seven minutes each. Okay. They were short. Okay. Um, and I believe that we, at least the steering committee always wants to be able to pose questions in advance of the meeting about the projects. I don't recall if we did that in each watershed, um, but this is actually I a thought... real bread and butter aspect of what we do in this in this program is have rigorous analysis to the extent we have the information and mm -hmm. discussion and dialogue about each project. So we definitely need more than a, I would say more than an hour with um, six projects in, in the watershed. Yeah, um, and I, forgive me, um, was the, are we sticking with the similar process where we're going to sort of score according to the priorities for each of the projects like we did last time? Yeah, we're going to need to put together a, a scoring sheet, you know, a worksheet for people to take notes on each presentation and then have mm -hmm. the information they need. I mean, we will be providing the data from each project submittal, so people will have the ability to look at that. But we do have some pass-fail criteria. And just for example, if you don't have the match, <laughs> you fail. If you're not going to be able to meet the match requirement, um, if you're not a DAC project, um, I know that's going to get a little tricky with some projects that say they have a DAC benefit, but we can't necessarily give them that full benefit. They might because they're not an entirely a DAC you know, area. So there's like proportionality and that, that gets a little tricky. But anyway, there's some pass fail criteria. There are certain eligibility things that have to be met. There's a self-certification form. Some of you may have seen that that was submitted as um, information so that you would understand that, that you have to commit to that. So we'll be kind of compiling all of that and providing it to everybody in advance of the meeting. So you'll have that information to work off of. Yeah, with six projects, you know, an hour or so, that's 10 minutes. So it doesn't really seem like that's a whole lot of time to get through the project presentation. And, and keep in mind, there's a the logistics of it too. We've got to go from one project to another. Um, so, um, so I agree that somewhere maybe in the hour and a half, two hour range or something like that might be more appropriate. Um, but, you know, I'm no longer the, the coordinator, so I'll leave that I'll leave that to others to decide. Well, I was trying to give you a buffer between when your meeting ended and um, in case we did end up going to a location. Um, so maybe the afternoon would work better. Yeah, and, and I appreciate that buffer, um, but I think that was kind of separate from what Lynn was just the overall when when it starts and when it ends kind of thing. Um, the overall time, but yes, I do appreciate that and like I said I, I do have that meeting um, in the morning, so if it could be maybe 10 to noon for, for example, or something like that, that would be that would be great. Um, but again i'm just i'm just one person and one project. Um, 
So I'll leave it to the rest to chime in and and ultimately I'll leave it to you guys to come up with the final decision and we'll just fit it in however it works. Does anyone else want to chime in on what time of day on August 23rd? Okay, if no one's chiming, I'm gonna assume. Well, you don't have everybody in this meeting that- Yeah, I don't presenting. have um, Pastitas, so. I think you're gonna to need to send an email out, a targeted email to those entities and just ask them. I mean, Kelly's, maybe she's not on anymore, I don't know, but um, I presume Kelly or Julia will be presenting. So it's gonna require a little bit of reaching out just to make sure. <clears throat> Okay, so I'll send out a thing for two time slots, either a 10 a.m. or like like a 2 p.m. And we'll see which one works. Great. Seems like a good okay. place to start. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. So with that, does anyone have any? Oh, I do see a question in the chat. Um oh, so morning would be better for City of Ventura. So that's another vote for um. 10 to 12. Okay. Um, with that, does anyone else open forum? Does anyone have any questions or comments, concerns about the watershed? Check in the chat, check in the Q&A. Doesn't look like it, so. I just want to say I appreciate all the activities that are going in the watershed. I mean, we could go on and on and on about our challenges and our issues. But one thing that I can say is that the Ventura River watershed, uh, the council, the communities, stakeholders are very, very much engaged um, in addressing these these issues and these challenges. And it really goes a long way towards allowing us to actually get the planning and the implementation funding to address them. So. Um, I would just want to say thank you to the community for all the engagement and the support. Cool. Thank you, Jamie. <laughs> okay, so with that, we'll say the meeting's over and keep an eye out for the um, the email about setting the time for the IRWM present presentations. Thank you. Thank you.